um, sorry, introducing Jen Horonjev. Um, she is member of the OMRECT uh, patient leadership team and very active in uh, the United States. Jen, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. So as Martin said, I'm Jen Horanjeff. I am a patient with juvenile idiopathic arthritis, also with ankylosing spondylitis, Sjogren's syndrome, Raynaud's, and probably some other things. But my main diagnosis is JIA. I am a consumer representative with the FDA, so I'll share a little bit of the perspective there, although I don't work for the FDA, but can certainly share some of that. And I am also an academic researcher at Columbia University Medical Center, and I run a patient organization known as Savvy Cooperative, which is a patient co-op here in the States and internationally as well. So I'm excited to be here with you all. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jen. Uh, my name is Martin de Witt. Um, I'm also on the OMRECT executive committee and uh, as well as on the patient leadership team uh, involved in OMRECT for quite, uh, quite a while. And um, I think it's a great initiative that we try also within OMRECT to promote uh, the education of our research partners and uh, inform you a little bit more about what OMRECT is and, and what we are doing. Um, what, what are we going to discuss uh, today? Um, well, we, we are really looking at what is the relationship between OMRECT and what do we have, uh, what's the relationship with, re with the regulatory process? We will discuss why PRP involvement in this process is important. And then uh, in the middle part, uh, Yen will introduce uh, what FDA follows for strategies to, for patient involvement. And she knows a lot about this because she has been involved um, uh, in this for quite a while. So I'm really looking forward to hear about that. Um, and then I will tell a little bit more about the strategy that EMA follows for patient involvement. And at the end, um, we might have a discussion about the difference between a patient research partner and a patient advocate. And we will end with some take home messages. The objectives of, of today is really to position the work that OMRECT is doing in the process of bringing pharmaceutical interventions to the patients. Second, we hope uh, that you will learn something about the vision and the policies of the FDA and EMA to give patients a voice in this regulatory process. So let's have a, a look at OMRECT and the regulatory process first. Um, very brief introduction about OMRECT. OMRECT stands for Outcome Measures in Rheumatology. And uh, OMRECT is responsible and um, develops core outcome sets for randomized clinical trials and also longitudinal observational studies, abbreviated as LOS, um, in specifically rheumatology. And a core outcome set is a combination of domains that are important from the perspective of all stakeholders to measure in clinical trials. And then it also says which instruments are best to use uh, and this all for the sake of standardization that we uh, measure effectiveness and safety in a similar way across all clinical trials. But having core sets, it's also important that, that OMRECT works on promoting the uptake of core outcome sets in clinical research, um, which means that we want all stakeholders uh, including representatives from the regulatory agencies to be aware of the core outcome sets, to use these sets, but also to assess applications that are sent in to the regulatory bodies 
that they review applications using the core outcome sets that have been broadly agreed on the basis of a very solid scientifically and evidence-based consensus method. Um, and that is specifically where we would like um, uh, to focus on today in this webinar. So how does this uh, process look like? Here you see a little bit the long process of developing new pharmaceutical uh, drugs. Um, as you know, it starts with discovery. Uh, you need to know what will be the target of a new medication. And then you have a preclinical phase of doing research, which could be lab-based research, uh, often also animal testing research. And as soon as that is all promising, which is not often the case, but when it is, you start with um, doing research in, in humans. And as you probably know, that is divided in different phases of research. First, research among healthy volunteers. That's only to check for safety and to look at the impact of different dosage of the new drug. And then in a second phase, you start with larger groups of uh, patient volunteers to check for efficacy and side effects. And then finally, phase three studies are larger studies where you look for more longitudinal outcomes. Um, and if you have done all this work, then you send your application to one of the regulator bodies. And in the United States, this, this is the FDA. In Europe, it is the EMA. And then, of course, you have uh, different other parts of the world, other countries that have their own rules for getting approval for a drugs to be marketed and that it is offered in a country. By saying this, what's not on this slide is the fact that there are also agencies that we call HDA bodies that between um, sending in an application to a regulator, um, but, but before um, assessment, they will do some cost effectiveness studies. And this is what we call the HDA uh, organizations or agencies, which stands for health technology assessments. Um, they say um, what the costs are. The FDA does, or, or some of the uh, regulators do not look at cost effectiveness, but only say, is it safe and effective that it allows to be brought to the market. And then afterwards, and these are also not in this slide, every country will have their own agencies who take a decision whether they will fund the medication um, through insurance companies or through the uh, national state. This is the, the, um, the, these are the phases, phase two and three, where we work also with patient research partners and they can help in defining what are the relevant core outcome sets. And actually in this phase, the deliverables and the work and activity that OMREC is doing is relevant. So the work that OMREC doing is relevant uh, as later on input for the FDA review and application process. And where it says FDA here, that could be every uh, regulator body. So let's have a look at um, why patient research partner involvement in this process is important. And I think I will 
hand over to Yen. Yes, thank you. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, so I'll have you just navigate through to, to pull up the text on the slide. So here we're going to talk about the, the relevance of patient engagement in the regulatory process, which to what Martin is speaking about already, and which you are probably already familiar with, with your uh, involvement with OMER Act, is to ensure that these core sets contain the domains that are relevant and important to the patient experience. And to make sure that those are typically going beyond sort of just the physical signs or the clinical symptoms that may already be in these outcome measure sets and provide the, the perspective of what's relevant to the quality of life to patients and family members. And to do this, trying to understand what these patient preferences are this can go beyond the, the drug development process and can be important for health policy, how drugs are marketed. I know that varies by country. And just to be able to improve the quality and decision making with a patient and their care team so that they can best understand which medication or treatment may be best for them. Next slide, please. So now to give kind of a high level overview of the role of patients in the regulatory process. And after this, we will break down more specifically what that looks like between the FDA and the EMA, but really to understand that these, or these agencies have now decided that it's important to have patient involvement. And it's, it's been a, an evolution to, to get patients more and more involved. So they're coming up with different guidance to be able to do so and to incorporate the patient view. And so we'll break that down with how the FDA has been doing it. They've come up with guidelines for patient reported outcomes or having meetings where the patient's voice is heard and recorded and, and many other ways that we'll talk through momentarily as has the EMA developed other guidance as well. And to also mention that the FDA and EMA also work together to make sure that they're uh, you know, comparing best practices and understanding how best to develop out future guidance for patient involvement. Uh, ultimately, this is to be able to help researchers and those developing treatments to identify the outcomes that are most important to patients or their family members and then not only to figure out what the outcomes of importance are, but to make sure that there are instruments that are valid and reliable to measure these outcomes that have been identified. This should be done in partnership where patients are as team members, that they're equal partners and have a voice and vote in, in some of these decisions. It's important to also note that particip participation is not based on just patient advocacy or promoting access to treatment but also in the conduct of the relevant and high quality research that's coming out of these uh, opportunities to engage. And so it's important for patients to be able to lend their voice. They also wanna make sure that they're providing the patient perspective in research activities that are not just for a specific disease, but can be for all rheumatic diseases, as well as even making sure these practices are brought into other therapeutic areas as well. Next slide. I do my best, <laughs> uh, but I see that I cannot go to the, yes, so, sorry for this. <laughs> Not a problem. There we go. So involving patients in outcome selection. This is something that you all may be familiar with, with your involvement in these types of activities. But as an example, patients with RA uh, tend to have higher scores on some of the depression questionnaires. and. This might not be because they themselves are depressed, although certainly mental health factors into uh, people's lives with RA, but it's because of how questions are, are being asked. So as an example, if asking something or responding to a question that I always have a slow start in the morning or I often feel tired or I can't do the same as before, that could put them into the bucket of being assigned as being depressed when in fact that might actually be part of what's happening with their RA. So therefore, this type of questionnaire is not valid in RA patients. So it's important for us to be thinking about how we're measuring these specific outcomes and thinking about things as reliability and validity of these different outcome measures. So as an example, pain has been one of the missing domains in myositis clinical trials, and that has been identified as something important to that community as well as fatigue and rheumatic diseases to make sure that those things are being included in the outcome measure uh, core sets that are being used in those clinical trials. 
Next slide, please. So now I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the FDA's patient involvement. I want to again give the disclaimer, I do not work for the FDA, but I've been an FDA consumer representative, so I will do my best to uh, give you a little bit of the history of patient engagement at the FDA. Now I know also cross-culturally we use different terms for this. The FDA uses terms like patient engagement, which means patient involvement. And so this has a long history, starting back in the 80s around the HIV and AIDS crisis. And really, it was these activists that started the whole movement of patient involvement. And they were demanding that their voices be heard because their community was dying and they wanted to make sure that people were listening to them. So that really is the, the impetus for the start of all of the engagement that's happened since. I won't you know, go through every detail on this timeline, but after that, they started including uh, cancer patients and has worked their way up to now having uh, patients involved in all the various committees. There's been certain legislation that I'll briefly walk through momentarily that has required that the patient voice be heard. And so that has certainly put more practices more policies into place to ensure that patients are being heard, and I will walk through that shortly. Next slide, please. So to talk through a few of the things that uh, the FDA does. Now, if you're familiar with any sort of United States government websites, it can be very challenging to sometimes find all of this information. I tried to synthesize some of it here of the different ways that patients are involved which you can also go back on the, the previous slide to, to get a little bit more information. But there's several different things that they do. So they have a patient representative program, which allows these patient reps to sit on committees and have voting rights, uh, depending on which uh, center they're part of. And so to let you know, there are about 200 plus patient representatives that uh, work with the FDA. But now I wanna tell you a little bit about the different centers so you can understand most of what's happening in the arthritis space is happening out of a center called CEDAR, which is the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. And they're the ones that are responsible for drug development. And so this is where a lot uh, sit out of, and this is one of the committees that I serve on, the Arthritis Advisory Committee. There's another center that is more for devices. This is CDRH, and this stands for Center for Devices and Radiologic Health. And what's interesting and the difference between these two centers is that patients who sit on the CEDAR committees have voting rights, whereas those who sit on CDRH do not. And so that's an interesting differentiation that uh, we haven't quite made it to where patients have an equal voice in the voting rights, depending on which center they are part of. CDRH, though, does have a patient preference initiative um, and is working harder to make sure that the voice of the patient is heard. They also have a patient engagement advisory committee also through the Center for uh, Devices and Radiologic Health. So it's the, the involvement of patients can vary and neither is really kind of perfected the way that they're working with patients, but they're working towards it. So, so patients can then participate in expert meetings. They can provide written comments during comment periods on various guidances that they're developing. So public comment is always welcome. Now, I'll speak more in depth about how we're talking about these new patient-focused drug development meetings. But to note that there's actually two kinds, ones that are led by the FDA that they have initiated, and ones that are externally led through patient advocacy groups that can bring to the attention of the FDA certain patient uh, priorities of a certain patient community. And then they also, after those PFDD meetings, which again stands for Patient Focused Drug Development, after the, the conclusion of those, they write up a report known as the Voice of the Patient, and that is published on the FDA site, which you can go and check out to see all the different learnings that they had from those meetings. Next slide, please. So to talk a little bit more about patient-focused drug development, this is a systematic approach to ensure that the patient's experiences, perspectives, means, and priorities are captured and meaningfully incorporated into drug development and evaluation. 
Next slide, please. All right. So, oh, I don't know if this is going to go one at a time. You can just pull that all up. Great, thank you. All right, so there's legislation that has required that the voice of the patient be heard. And so there's something known as PDUFA, PDUFA 5, the Prescription Drug User Fee Act, that required that uh, there's certain initiatives that needed to begin to be able to obtain the patient perspective on various conditions and therapies. So during from 2012 to 2017, they were charged with holding 20 meetings between the various centers. Uh, one center that you'll see here is the CBER, which uh, I didn't mention before, but that's a center for biologics evaluation and research. Uh, and to be able to increase the FDA's patient representation as special government employee consultants. And that is what I am as a consumer representative. So then there came PDUFA 6 and something known as the 21st Century Cures Act. This is again legislation that uh, required that the FDA stay committed and have more of a staff capacity to work with patients and to make sure their voice is heard. They have a new patient affairs office that helps to be the liaison uh, between patients who don't quite know who in the FDA to speak with. So they help to navigate that. They've created a series of guidance documents. Um, they create and maintain the, a repository of tools as well, and they revise existing pro procedures and policies to include approaches for incorporating the patient focus. I believe there might be one more piece on that slide. Yeah, so then the FDA also requires um, that or requires that the FDA develops a plan to continue to issue draft and final guidance on the collection and use of patient experience data. So they, they put out guidance and they hold workshops and requests for comments to make sure that the, the, those other stakeholders have a say in moving this guidance forward. Next slide, please. So oh, I'm not sure why that's showing up this way, but uh, so the patient-focused uh, drug development at this point has had 26 meetings. And so not that I'm going to list them all here, but it gives you a sense for, um, you know, really all the different kinds of meetings they've had to understand the priorities of patients within these very communities. And I'll bring your attention, there was recently this summer one in chronic pain that um, you know garnered a lot of uh, representation from the populations that we all may be part of. Um, also this summer, there was an externally led patient-focused drug development meeting on juvenile idiopathic arthritis that I participated in. And so there are other ones that, um, again, if, if advocacy groups bring it to the forefront, they can pr create these externally led FDD, uh, PFDD meetings. Next slide, please. So here's um, a roadmap to the patient-focused outcome measures in clinical trials. And this is something that has been just released in the draft guidance around um, the PFDD meetings as well. There was just a meeting held last week, a workshop to get feedback on the proposed guidance on, on these kind of outcome measures. And so you'll notice here in this table, the term COAs, also known as COAs, and those are clinical outcome assessments. And there are different types of clinical outcome assessments. And what we all are probably more familiar with are the PROs, the patient reported outcomes. So you can kind of keep that in mind as we look at these graphs. This is sort of the same sort of thing that uh, OMERAC does is has its sort of own roadmap on how to get to the end of actually coming up with how to measure the outcomes that are important. So starting with section one, understanding the disease or condition, here you can see there are several ways that they're proposing this should be done, either through natural history of the disease and studies to understand um, more about the condition, understanding it by patient subpopulations to make sure you're understanding a diverse perspective within a patient community, to understand the current clinical practices around treating or caring for somebody with these conditions, and then to make sure you're hearing the patient perspective as well as caregivers or other experts and really understanding the benefit risks that certain communities are willing to take on 
as well as the impact of the disease. And then if you look at section two, conceptualizing clinical benefit, here we try to identify the concepts of interest uh, for cl meaningful clin clinical benefit and how a patient survives, feels, or functions, as well as defining context of use, both for clinical trials, understanding uh, the disease and conditions uh, criteria, the trial design, the endpoints that are being defined, as well as how they're thinking about the endpoint positioning. And then lastly, this ultimately culminates in trying to select the correct PRO in our case, um, understanding the, the patient reported outcome measure set. And if one exists already, understanding if uh, one can be repurposed or modified to fit the needs of the community that, at interest, or if it needs to develop a completely new PRO. Next slide, please. And with that, I will turn it back to Martine to tell a little bit more about how the EMA uh, works with patients. Yeah, thank you, Jen. I think uh, you gave a wonderful overview of um, what the FDA is, a uh, bit more what they are doing. Uh, and here, I think we will have a, a very brief um, break just to ask, are there any questions to Jen related to um, the FDA, what he has told uh, us, or any other question. I didn't see anything in the chat and I don't hear anything. And this is Heidi. I think she gave an excellent uh, overview about the FDA, so I don't need any more information. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Heidi. Um, Let's continue and have a look at uh, the EMA. EM is in, in a certain way the counterpart of the FDA uh, and they develop um, uh, assessment and reviews um, that are relevant for Europe. A little bit of history, they are younger than the FDA. They were established by the European Union in 1995 um, and 10 years later, started to interact with patient and uh, consumer groups. Um, in sex, in, in 2006, they um, started to establish a patient and consumer working party, um, and they included representatives from 20 uh, major active patient organizations, uh, including the ones that also were at the beginning of the FDA and you have to think about the HIV cancer organizations, but also those for cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and lung diseases. 2014, so also similar to the FDA, um, it was after 10 years that they uh, found out that organizing engaging patients also in the regulatory process uh, requires solid support from professional assessment and, and that's what they did in 2014 when they established a department for public engagement. Currently they have two full-time staff uh, members that are coordinating patient engagement in um, uh, reviews. Ongoing are always pilot projects um, where EMA tests different ways of engaging patients in this process, which means that they are quite aware that there is no one way that fits all, and they are still looking for ways for particular projects and, and processes which are the most appropriate and effective. Um, they follow the same principle that patients at all stages uh, should be involved in this in the regulatory life cycle. This is a kind of uh, visualization of the process, um, and um, I see that it might be different to read. And you see there are quite a lot of committees um, with all their own abbreviations. Um, but you have to look at the orange um, 
uh, clouds and that are all the places where currently patients have influence on all the different committees and that is right from the start um, when uh, applications are entered into the process the pre-submission stage um, as in the evaluation uh, stage but also afterwards if uh, medications are uh, approved to enter the mark patients will also be involved in the post authorization monitoring uh, phase so what are the different strategies that they they have piloted uh, and I uh, uh, mention here uh, a few of them they did something like a what they call in English pilot swing waiting uh, to elicit patient preferences for benefit risk analysis uh, and th this contains that what you are doing is you make a matrix where you have different treatments in the left column and you ask patients to rate them for different outcomes and um, depending on the outcome that a patient values most they might end up with a preference for another kind of treatment or way of admission it all depends on the patient preference and this is a, a kind of new methodology for more personalized medicine into the um, uh, review of applications they have specifically in this example of myeloma patients uh, did uh, do some larger studies eliciting patient preferences large numbers looking at uh, the benefits and risk of cancer treatments and uh, looking for the uh, estimate um, acceptance for new treatments so here it is what are the uh, individual trade-offs that patients make between for instance side effects and other risks and the benefits that they ac expect from a new treatment EMA is, is an uh, EU Institute and they are actively involving also in uh, European projects specifically those uh, that are uh, initiated and coordinated uh, by the IMI IMI stands for the innovative medicine initiative it's a kind of private uh, public uh, sponsored research program uh, there's there are large budgets and they are heavily uh, sponsored by pharmaceutical companies uh, to enhance research in different areas they have calls for different diseases and um, um, and they and the EMA currently partner in two projects and one is the protect uh, project where uh, EMA coordinates um, the project and um, this is a project that focuses on the questions of public patient involvement so this is part of their um, endeavor to find out what are the most effective and feasible ways of patient involvement in the activities that they uh, conduct and then finally they also partner in the IMI project prefer that looks into ways and methodologies for eliciting patient preferences in benefit risk assessments um, during the drug life cycle patient engagement for EMA is a progressive journey so they started um, with no much knowledge uh, no much support but it has uh, now evolved in a, a more explicit involvement uh, along all the different phases. EMA um, has three 
forms of involvement. It could be the representation uh, of a patient community. Um, so that is a group of patient organizations uh, in one particular area of health. It could be representation by one organization. Um, and when we are discussing in Europe for rheumatic diseases, um, ULAR is one organization that has representation in uh, a couple of committees. And then patients can also apply as individual experts. So EMA has a procedure in place where people can solicit, uh, send in letters of competence and motivation, um, and then they will be appointed as individual patient experts. Um, in the right column, you see all the different uh, type of tasks that patients uh, are asked to give feedback on. So it has to do with the selection of endpoints, defining target populations uh, for studies, um, advice on what is an appropriate study duration, what treatment administrations are preferred, um, and also about formulation of different dosages, uh, and specifically which ones are acceptable or not. Clinical relevance um, is assessed by patients and then combined with statistical significance. Um, they look at risk potential and um, also at the end ethical aspects and whether the informed consent procedure is appropriate and uh, in line with patients' expectations. So to give a little bit of examples where EULA uh, is part of the committees, um, there is one EULA uh, PRP and I think um, Heidi, this, this, I think this was you, gave feedback on an EMA patient video about a biosimilar medicine. That's correct, Martin. Yeah. Um, then one of the network members participated in a scientific procedure uh, to review and advise on a new biological drug. This was specifically in the context of a uh, phase three study for rheumatoid arthritis. And then very recently, OMRACT uh, responded on a call, but this is about the FDA, um, where they ask for input about standard core clinical outcome assessments and endpoints and uh, OMREC advised on what are preferred criteria for a good assessment of clinical outcomes and endpoints in clinical studies. Uh, Heidi, I know I haven't asked you before, uh, could you would, would you be willing to share uh, a few lines about your experience with, um, with giving this feedback and, and your re relation with the uh, EMA? Uh, I was um, taken as a member in February, I think, and then just a week later I got uh, the question if I wanted to give feedback on this um, patient video about why a similar. And then it was, uh, it was a very nice thing to do and it was very well done by uh, them uh, making this video. It was very informative and I think that will be in excellent use both in uh, America and in Europe for uh, letting p patients understand why biosimilar is not dangerous to change. Yeah. Do you feel you were able to give uh, meaningful feedback to the EMA? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, and thanks for sharing that. Okay. Uh, for EMA, what is key? the key to successful engagement? Um, what I started with, uh, they are very um, convinced that at this point, there's no one size fits all approach. So they 
really look for each new uh, application or type of, of research for a, a tailored engagement method. They emphasize that there's always need for flexibility. Uh, although, of course, they, they have knowledge about the range of well-tested methodologies that they would like to uh, see being used. Um, and uh, over the last five years, they have developed a ro robust system of tailored support and training uh, for, patient, uh, for patients that are involved uh, in the work that they do. And uh, for those who are interested, they have a regular patient new newsletter where they uh, provide information about um, new drugs that have been assessed and that have been approved or not approved. Um, and they also give updates on the work of different um, committees. And this all in a language that is uh, understandable for uh, people like you and me. Patient influence on EMA reviews um, goes also, and this is uh, partly similar to the FDA. Uh, they ask for input on proposed protocol designs, uh, participation of patients in expert meetings, uh, or written consultations on specific medicines evaluations. So these are calls that go out, uh, questions for advice and, and people and communities can respond within a, a certain time frame. Um, patients can be voting members on different EMA scientific committees. And finally, uh, almost all medical information that is produced for the public are also refused by patient experts. They have announced uh, that evidence from their own monitoring and evaluation have shown that uh, the contributions that patients provide make a real difference in the work that they uh, conduct compared to uh, 10 years ago. So, um, learning from patients even after drug comes to the market. That is something that both the FDA and EMA are concerned about um, and that they are involved in. So, here it is about post-market surveillance and pharmacovigilance um, projects and also looking more and more to what we call real world evidence. Uh, and here you might also think about more pragmatic trials um, where uh, patients and, and new drugs are studied in a more open population of patients with a particular disease. And this is also to address the issue that some people say that clinical trials, uh, although they provide uh, robust evidence, they also have some shortcomings because of the homogeneous patient groups that they are studying and uh, showing more positive effectiveness than if you do the same study um, in the real world, and that's what we also call real world evidence. Jen, would you like to add something here? No, I think it, what you're saying is the, the types of things that uh, are being grappled with in the United States as well, of making sure that we're understanding how certain treatments that are being studied would affect people with various comorbidities. I'm sure many people on this call have perhaps multiple diagnoses that may in fact preclude them from participating in various studies. And so therefore we would note, learn the efficacy of those drugs as they are coming to market. So I think that this is something that we are certainly focused on as well um, in the United States. Yeah. Thanks, Yen, for, for adding that. 
Okay, um, finally, uh, when we will share the slides with you, um, we have uh, added here a couple of references that um, uh, where you can find more information about what we have been um, trying to uh, tell in this um, workshop. And uh, by doing this, I think we have come to an end of this presentation.